Hello. Night practice live number 10. It's number 10. That's a reason to celebrate. I got some freshly squeezed lemonade here. Hello, Maya. Hello, Lucy. Hello, Tanya. Um, yes, Night Practice Live, number 10. My name is Omer Ashano. I'm a jazz violinist from Israel, and I'm here to share my practice routine with you guys um, and answer the audience's questions um, regarding what I do, how do I approach certain things, uh, and it's your chance to um, uh, ask me questions and get some knowledge and help from me. Um, okay, so... Um, yes, today we're listening to some uh, uh, Seben music or Congolese rumba. Um, I was kind of in the mood of Congolese rumba in uh, the past week because of the recording session that I did of my new music that is kind of influenced from, from this music. Um, let me know if it's might be a little too loud. Um, so, um, so yeah, so I, I'm kind of in, in this mood recently. Um, Congolese rumba, as, as you can hear, was developed in Congo, in uh, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And um, it's very unique for, for its um, interleaving guitar styles, where you have two guitars playing uh, kind of a counter counterpoint between them um, like re playing repeating lines that together create the harmony hello shalom hello Mori. Um so um, so yeah so uh, another name for this guitar technique is called Seben uh, Seben in the uh, it's really, really cool music and very interesting technique that I'm kind of, um... Hello! Um... Uh... So yeah, so music that I was investigating for the past several years and uh, now playing some, some music that is influenced by that. Uh, so again, hello everyone who's joining in. Uh, Shuvan and Akio. Yeah, and Abhinai Bakashi. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Hello. Uh, as I said, this is Night Practice Live number 10. Um, we'll start very soon. I'll start with the actual practicing very soon. Uh, just waiting for a few more people to join in. Um, yes, this is your chance to watch me at my practice routine. Ask me any questions if you have and uh, get any any tips if you'd like to anything you're working on currently uh, I'll be glad to help um, so as I like to start each session every every Saturday I like to start it um, before I get into practicing and shedding um, I like to say thanks for one thing to keep positive attitude before we start uh, a rough, rough practice session. Um, so actually something I'd like to um, um, express my gratitude towards this week is, uh, is the internet and the ability that I have uh, through the internet, well first to get exposed to any music from any corner of the world, which is one of my favorite things. I'm, I'm really, really curious about uh, finding new musics that I or no one else but that, you know, people in that region have heard of. Uh, I very like folklore music. Uh... Oh, Shuvan, great questions. Uh, I'll, I'll be right, right answering that. Um, so, um, 
so with um, so yeah so thanks to that I can explore uh, new types of new genres of music hello and but most importantly I actually kind of kind of recently I I somehow got an an ad for this Congolese rumba guitar course uh, which was just amazing targeting, you know, marketing targeting, audience targeting. Um, so, uh, Shalom Moran. Um, so yeah, so I was, you know, I, I kept working, learning this style just by trying to transcribe, trying to hear the guitar lines and trying to, you know, to play them on the guitar. And this way I learned this composition technique. But recently I got, I found this course or this course found me uh, of Congolese uh, Congolese rumba guitar, and um, so there's this great Congolese guitarist who who teaches the course, and I'm working on it. And some of the stuff you see that I post, like on my stories, like what I posted today, for example, is like lines, different lines that I learn from that course, uh, and it's amazing because I really get to learn the insides, like the guts of this music. And through that, you know, it gives me better tools to compose music in that vein. Uh, and I'm not necessarily composing Congolese rumba music or sungura um, uh, per se. I still record, I, I, it's still my own original music, but I like to incorporate this kind of guitar style and, you know, blend it with new harmonies, new rhythms. So being learning how to play that really helps me in the process of understanding how this technique works and how can I build these great lines that work together uh, to create harmony and don't sound too um, too condensed or too busy. Um, okay, so yeah, so that's what I'm grateful for. I'm grateful for the internet for giving me this amazing course, which I'm still working on. Um, Sh uh, Shuvan uh, or Shuvanjan. I'm, how, how, how do you pronounce your name? Like, is it Shuvan is your first name? Uh, anyway, uh, Shuvan asks, how did you start transcribing Ethiopian and Eritrean music? Did it start from your violin, from recordings, from shows? Um, so yeah, like I said, I really love folklore music. Of, I'm just drawn to people's music. Uh, and since, since a young age, I was um, I was digging uh, like African music of, of uh, Shuban Jan. All right, thank you. Um, Shuban Jan, is that Indian? Um, so I was I was digging all types of African music uh, since pretty young age. Um, I was really into that. And I actually really like understood what is that style of uh, Tigrinya, which is that um, cool Bangladesh. Hope to visit there one day. Um, so, oh, nice, cool. Um, so. Um, so yeah, that that Eritrean Ethiopian music, which which you refer to, in my in my case, it's mostly Tigrinian music that I'm influenced by, but also yeah, also uh, Ethiopian music, Amharic Ethiopian music. Uh, it's music that I, I was actually exposed to and really learned. Uh, I mean, I've heard these sounds before, but I really like understood what is this genre. I actually, uh, during the time I lived in Tel Aviv in um, in Israel before I moved to New York City and then got back here because of the pandemic but when I lived in in New York City uh, so excuse me before I lived in New York City I lived in Tel Aviv and there are a lot of Eritrean nightclubs and venues uh, also some Ethiopian clubs uh, restaurants uh, but in southern Tel Aviv there are a lot of Eritrean Eritreans and uh, um, and um, and also a lot of Sudanese and um, yeah, mo mostly Eritrean and Sudanese uh, refugees um, that they they flee 
to Israel, um, you know, during the, because of all the civil civil war happening um, and conflict happening uh, in uh, Sudan and Eritrea. Uh, to I mean, the 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 um, the conflict looks different uh, these days, uh, but but past the like I guess something like seven seven years I think or even more there have been a lot of um, a lot of uh, uh, Eritrean immigration uh, to Tel Aviv to Israel um, so I actually got exposed to that to Tigrinya music in in Tel Aviv I um, I heard it in like in in their you know clubs and weddings you hear that music from the streets coming out from the clubs I, I went to some of uh, to there was actually an Ethiopian club uh, which I used to kind of go often where they had um, uh, a person playing krar which is the the harp that is played in in Ethiopian and uh, Tigrinian and Eritrean music um, and I also got to play one time with this Eritrean crowd player. So this is how I really get exposed to the music and and, and mostly, yeah, mostly just try to kind of imitate the sounds with the violin. I didn't really do much official transcribing of that, I, I could say. It's not like I really learned any like solos played or lines played by these musicians. I just listen a lot to this music and um, and messed around with it on the violin, tried to imitate that sound of you know the the sound of the these scales and the sound of how they do their embellishments and also kind of the sound you know I also heard some masinko uh, like the Ethiopian um, violin um, so also kind of influenced by that um, yeah that's how that's how I got into it but I can say I'm a professional you know. Ethiopian music uh, violinist like I haven't really learned it officially like I don't know the names of the scales the different um, uh, the different Ethiopian scales that I'm playing and all that or the embellishments I'm sure there are proper way to play the embellishments which I'm kind of doing I think but not not really uh, haven't really learned it properly and officially I hope to one day um, Okay, so as I said, yes, we were listening to some Seben music or uh, Congolese rumba, um, and uh, that was Tabule Rocheru, uh, another great guitar player. Um, I, I actually made a, a playlist of that if you guys want to check out on, on my Spotify. I, I don't know, I don't think I linked it on my Spotify artist page yet. Um, but you can probably look look up Seben Evolution, and I actually did a playlist of of the progression that kind of describes the progression and evolution of the style from uh, uh, all the way from actually Cuban music that was played in Congo and Congolese musicians influenced by Cuban music that was played there during the 30s and 40s, and then the development of Congolese rumba into what's called sukus, and then later on immigrating into um, into uh, more Eastern Africa, Eastern Southern Africa, where it developed to styles like uh, Wenga and, uh, and Sungura and um, uh, 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 there's another one in Tanzania, they call it differently, but you get the point. Uh, so, so you can check out this playlist in, uh, on Spotify called Seben Evolution. Um, Okay, Tanya is asking, do you have any tricks to loosen up your hands when they feel stiff? Um, and of course, Shuban, wait, Shubanjan, yes. Uh, yeah, totally, you know, totally fascinating to see how, how each each musician from growing up in different region of the world eventually we all kind of you know we go into this through this funnel of different cultures and you know some of us end up you know in new york or in canada and in and, and the cultures keep on blending and it creates very interesting uh combinations 
Uh, so to your question, Tanya. Okay, so let's get let's get uh, let's do something with that before we get to the other stuff I wanted to do today. Um, okay. Um, well, it depends. Uh, uh, Tanya, are you are you interested in um, specifically in an in an exercise for your left hand or your right hand? Because there are different exercises um, for that. Um, I mean, general, generally, we want to we want to try and uh, the best way to to loosen up is to practice while you're loosen up. Uh, I know it sounds kind of dumb, but it actually the you know the best advice that I could give. Um, you need to find a way in which you can play a very, very simple exercise, very, very slowly, uh, in a way that is so easy for you, where you can keep on focusing on, uh, um, keep on uh, keeping your, your looseness in your muscles. And looseness is important not only in, you know, in the hand or wrist, or in the right hand and wrist. It's important to have looseness in the shoulders, in the neck, even in the, in the belly, you know, sometimes uh, we tend to, um, um, to uh, contract our, our belly muscles or uh, abdomen, abdomen, you know what I mean. <laughs> that muscle here, uh, responsible for, for coughing and, and speaking. Um, is that the abdomen? 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 <laughs> How is that muscle called? Um, okay, so more left hand. Um, so I think one of the things that, um, that causes tension many times is actually lack of coordination. And one of the best ways to, to improve your looseness as you're playing is to improve coordination. Abdominal. Abdomino. Okay. So yeah, sometimes we even uh, contract our abdominal when we when we play. Okay, so it's um, it's important to really be aware of all of all of these muscles uh, and making sure that we don't tense them up if not necessary. So what happens when? Um... <laughs> uh, hola, Oscar, and hello. Marcia. Um, so what happens when, when we lack coordination is that our body starts to, to stiffen up uh, muscles that are not actually necessary to, to, you know, to, to stress out. Um, for example, uh, if some of you um, remember your beginner beginner violin days or if you guys have uh students of your own then uh maybe you taught them this exercise it's i call it the lizard um where you just need to climb on your bow and keep all the fingers uh glued to the stick so going down is is not as hard going up is uh going down the bow is harder and what happens with a lot of students um, is that when they do that, when they begin doing that, the hands are still not, the fingers are not still very flexible. They don't have much control over the, the you know, the slight motoric motion and control of the, of the right hand. So you'll see them doing this. They're like, focus on, on the, you know, focus so hard on doing this. And then you'll see their left hand kind of like reacting to it. Or like it would, you know, they would hold it weird, you know, like, like you, you could see the tension in building up in the left hand, um, or the left hand fingers, and sometimes you would even see them uh, imitating the motions that they do um, with their right hand with their left hand. That's happening due to lack of coordination. That's what happens when, when our 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 brain doesn't understand, doesn't comprehend the motion well enough. And it's kind of like a bug. Um, so instead of like, you need energy only in this part of, of your hand in order to 
you know, to do this. But because, because your, your, um, your body doesn't understand this motion well enough, there's kind of a bug and other parts of your body starts to react to it too, starts to, you know, to, or to tense up or to try and imitate that, that motion. That, this is a problem of lack of coordination. This is why I say that many times the way to fix, co um, excuse me, the way to fix tension is to address coordination. Um, so for example, a good coordination exercise for the left hand, uh, is, um, uh, is this, um, you can take, it depends on, on what level you are, how, you know, how, um, how proficient you are, uh, with your left hand. If you're really a beginner, I would just suggest doing something like this. Start up with just pluck each string with the left hand uh, and then using each finger, uh, each different finger every time. And always making sure, obviously, that there are, two, there are two things we always need to keep in mind, the task and the rest of our body. Um, so you wanna focus on the task, but then once you get a little, you know, a little rest of using your brain bandwidth, try to keep, to remind yourself to release Release the shoulders, release the neck, release your right hand, release your belly, anything that could be tensed up. You want to try and, and practice in an effortless way. You want to feel and imagine as if uh, what you're doing right now is the easiest thing in the world and your fingers are just like butter, you know? Um, then the next step, you can, you can do that with, uh, so place a finger and then pluck with the, um, with the next finger in line. Okay, so that's more for, uh, uh, that's more of a beginner um, level of this exercise. Now, a harder thing is to place each finger on a different string about like a whole step in a distance of about a whole step from each other. And, um, and then do kind of the same thing. So pluck with the first finger while keeping all the rest of the fingers attached to the strings. Then, and again, what would happen when you don't have good coordination yet and, and uh, uh, good uh, finger, what's called fingers, uh, finger independence, then your, your like third and fourth finger would, would try to do the same action, right? You're, you're trying to pluck with your with your second finger and then suddenly your your fourth finger will activate itself and try to pluck it too okay uh, so we want so this is how this tension happens when you don't have that finger independence and you you start tensing up muscles around that area whether it's other fingers or the wrist um, that are not necessary to to uh, to tense up you know muscles that could be loses butter because there's just one mo one motion that you need to do right now and it's just the motion coming from the muscle here uh really good to practice that with a metronome by the way okay um Next stage of that, which I still didn't even get to really, um, is trying to pluck two, uh, do different variations of, of two fingers simultaneously, okay? That's hard. Uh, so you can't really, you can't really, um, you know, pluck. It's really hard to pluck this way, but try to at least do the, you know, the action of, of releasing and placing the finger in the same time. It's really, it's really hard to, to pluck it when the finger is, is uh, still there, but just do the, practice this motion. And, oh man, I got confused. And yes, and then 
you can do this and this so practice different different variations um, of that uh, of you know this fingers finger hammering or finger plucking uh, motion that would really develop uh, your coordination and your finger independence and will eventually lead to more looseness in in the hand um, now um, hello Ellie and Jacques um, now another another thing you could do um, okay this is kind of a this is kind of a secret exercise that I give to um, that I give to my students. I don't read. I, I don't usually share it uh, publicly, so keep this as a secret, because <laughs> I just I want to do like hopefully like kind of an ebook about uh, this method one day, uh, because it's something that I've kind of discovered myself. Um, so you're welcome to be my um, test rabbits and uh, or test monkeys or test humans um, and try that exercise and let me know how it works. But this is something that really helped me in, uh, in really developing control and loosening up, um, loosening up my hands. So um, for th this is a great exercise to start uh, for your, uh, your right hand, for example. You know, many times we have uh, bounces in, that happen in the bow, right? Especially if we play slow bow, then there will be spots on the bow where our where our, we kind of lose a little control over the motion and the the bow bounces a little bit. Um, this happens kind of because something I like to kind of call um, um, like uh, it's like a road bump or uh, is that I think it's called road bumps. Um, or it's almost like um, uh, like uh, uh, how do you call that? Like uh, you know, if if you're if you're sand sandpapering using sand, sanding, I think sanding um, a piece of wood, right? It has bumps. It has different. You know, it has an uneven, unstraight shape and you want to sand the um, the piece of wood in order to straighten it um, so it's kind of what we want to do but in our muscles so the way to do that um, is just to imitate the motion that you're doing in order to um, whatever motion you're trying to work on whether it's the motion of the right bow or whether it's uh, finger motion you want to create a very, very super slow motion version of that motion. And then what you will find out, the slower you do that, is that there are points where your muscle and the motion kind of gets stuck. We're trying to create a, we're trying to create a smooth motion, right? That's the key, you know, to not have these uh, bow bounces and that's the key uh, in order to have good uh, good speed, agility in the fingers, um, we want to have to be able to create smooth motion. Now, the quicker we do it, it's really easy to to create um, you know um, an illusion of a smooth motion. But if we do that in slow motion, we'll start notice noticing that there are spots here. Did you see that? There are spots in the motion where there'll be kind of a road, road bump and our muscle will kind of skip, you know, skip and, you know, a, a, a milli inch and not create that smooth motion. And these spots, I think, are spots where our brain just doesn't know the motion yet. It doesn't control the motion in that area of the muscle. Um, it's almost like you need to teach your nerves every little bit 
of the of the motion. So what would happen uh, is yes, yeah, that we have these jumps uh, in some part of the motion. So let's say I have a jump here. I feel that when I go down or up very slowly, my finger cannot create a smooth motion, rather it's it's kind of like skipping a, a beat. So I would like to focus on that area of motion, which is around here for me, and then just go, you know, back and forth very, very slowly. And you kind of teach your, your finger to control that level of motion and create smooth motion there. And that's why, why I think of sandpaper. It's, if, it's almost as if there's a, you know, there's a bump in the wood there and we need to go over it again and again and again in order to stri straighten it. So that's what we do, but with the muscle, we just kind of go over that region where our motion is not smooth and we just kind of straighten it up, sanding it up. Okay, so you can do that with, I, I used to practice this in, you know, at, at home or, or in the subway, some, you know, and the subway it would look weird if I just stand like this and do this, but you know, I would just, I would do like smaller exercises just with my fingers, for example. I would just sit and just like kind of work on raising each finger very slowly, making sure not to, not to give, not to give that finger to anyone <laughs> looking at me and starting a fight. It's really easy to get killed in New York City subway. Um, so, you know, and then you can do that with the wrist as well. Just do the motion, go through the motions very, very, very slowly. And you'll be surprised at how much it develops your control and lightness and flexibility of, of these muscles. Just, it's, it's really like you're teaching your brain the, the motion from, you know, from point zero. Because we learn how to do these motions very quickly, right? This and this and, but we never teach our brain how to do these motions super slowly and then there are gaps and these gaps then then are, are being expressed in our playing and in our control of the of of our hands and fingers so especially helpful in um, uh, with right head hand motion you know i usually have you might you feel these bumps around this area of uh, open um this like level of arm opening and again the slower you go the more bumps you'll find so I think I found one here there was there was an area where my motion kind of got stuck and not smooth so I'm just gonna focus on that area and just work on on this tiny area and do the motion through it very very slowly So that's not an easy that's not an easy exercise. It's um, it takes a lot of brain power and it, it you know if you focus very hard on something it kind of makes you irritated and anxious. So that's the kind of exercise that makes you irritated and anxious. So but if you're able to push through it, um, you know you really get into a meditative place uh, where you really deeply connect to to each motion that you do um so don't tell uh, about this exercise to no one practice it yourself and let me know um how it feels and and if you feel like it does any progress um and if not it was good you know meditation time um all right great questions so far uh, thank you everyone for, for asking questions. Um, more stuff, I, less stuff I need to come up with. Uh, okay, so now let's move on to the stuff uh, I had to come up with for this session. Um, and of course, let me know if you have any more questions along the way. Um, something I wanted to practice today was um, 
improving our inner ears. It's funny, we got very like uh, into a very, um, I don't know, kind of very, uh, oh, did you, did you try it? Like, does it feel crazy, the feeling of it? Um, yeah, we got kind of deep with the previous exercises and this, this one's actually is, is also kind of um, like very deep focus kind of exercise. Um, but yeah, let's, let's talk about it. Awesome. Keep me posted guys. Let me know how, how, uh, how it goes. If you feel like any progress, if you feel you get better at it, or if you feel that, uh, it helps you get better at, at playing. Um, so, um, yeah, inner ears. Um, awesome yeah as yeah the you know at the beginning stages um it's definitely gonna feel a lot of bumps i got to places where i was working so so slow on it and i had like um very little control over these little motions that um that I, I i would feel at points like my finger got stuck <laughs> like i would feel like i cannot i cannot push it any farther i don't know because i'm like you get so focused and you're trying to create that smooth smooth motion and then i don't know i uh, there were parts where i feel like i i can't push it anymore um it's funny it's really it really gets you in a in a very deep like headspace um so, Shu Wanjan is a cyclist. Oh, that's interesting. Is it like is it a common exercise for cyclists to to do the motion like the the leg motion slowly? That's interesting. Yeah, it's basically for for any any motion. Um, <laughs> basically for any motion that that you do uh in your body you know i think it it could be very beneficial to to try and and do some of the motion that we do super slowly i think i think i got the idea for that through uh feldenkrais and alexander technique which i was practicing for a while um i kind of had a little you know i touched on both um interesting cyclists and runners yeah it it makes it makes total sense um like i said um i touched on uh both on feldenkrais technique and alexander technique which are very similar um called like movement or body craftsmanship kind of arts um and it's kind of what you do, like they teach you, like in Alexander Technique, you would go a whole class and you'll just practice getting up from a chair and sitting down. And you just have to be very, um, very conscious and very loose through each motion and do it very slow. And I think practicing that and, and really seeing what impact it has to just try and do this, you know, the most mundane physical actions that you do every day, like, you know, pick up a, a cup or, or getting off from a chair or, or, or getting up from bed. We do these motions in such a, uh, such a, um, um, such an inefficient and such a damaging way. Um, and that kind of like opened the, the thought process for me of, of practicing these like micro motions uh, of of the of our body so so give you know try that with your right hand try that with uh, left left hand fingers try that with uh, shoulders anything you know I'm sure that it could be of great benefit generally for for better use and and uh, and for a healthier you know healthier motion in anything we do uh, but yeah, in our case, we're, we're, we're just, we're seeing how it applies to violent playing. 
Um, okay, we have like 20 minutes. So, um, inner ears. Um, just one, wondering if if I should go there now because it's another like big subject and deep subject. Um, what do you guys say? Is there anything else um, regarding more violent technique that you would like to ask? Uh, or would you like me to get into, into developing inner ears and the importance of... Um, of uh, our inner inner musical ear. Um, all right. Um, so inner ears. That's also something I kind of, um, I kind of got into through different practice. Um, I used to practice Vipassana meditation. Um, um, uh, Shubhanjan, you might, you might know this, this uh, type of practice, uh, even though it's, it originated in, uh, probably in, in Tibet. Um, it's kind of Buddhistic, you know, it's a Buddhistic uh, meditation practice, but uh, I wasn't doing it for any like religious or, or uh, spirit. I mean, it is spiritual reasons, but it was mostly as, as, as a practice. I'm not a very, um, I'm not a very uh, spiritual person in that sense where I like uh, practice any religions or, or beliefs in superpowers or unnatural uh but to me it was just it was just a, a a type of practice a mental practice uh in a challenge i really like to challenge myself so i went when i was uh 21 i went to a vipassana um a vipassana silent retreat which is basically 10 days where you learn the um you learn this type of meditation, but in addition, you spend time in, in like a center and you don't speak or uh, communicate or read or do anything basically but that uh, meditation practice. So you have a very clear schedule each day, like you wake up at around 4 a.m., uh, you have some private meditation time, then there's group meditation, then there's breakfast, then there's private meditation time, then there's group meditation, learning, uh, and basically 10 days where you're being silent and practicing meditation, eating and sleeping. Um, eating usually very, like very good uh, vegan food. Um, so so I, I did these retreats several times and, and also was practicing it um, um, in my daily life for a while um, and I think through that I kind of started um, really connecting to uh, to how I can recreate sounds in my head um, so I don't know if I, every person could get to this level of being able to hear a pitch and recreate a pitch in his head but yeah I don't think it's something that anyone could just start off with so you need to have some some sort of musical hearing to begin with, some experience singing uh, to begin with in order to be able to do that. But the point is uh, to try and recreate a pitch in inside your head. So the same way we can imagine uh, memories or imagine feelings and visuals, basically. Uh, we can also imagine sensations, phys physical sensations, um it's harder but it's possible it's something you know that i definitely very felt felt very strongly during the retreats where you're in a very uh, focused mind space uh i felt like i could imagine really imagine the touch of sand on on my uh legs or something like that um and the, in the same way we're able to uh v really uh visualize uh sounds 
So I started messing around with that and I and I kind of figured that it's a great way to to improve my mus musicality and improvisation because the best improvisation comes from uh from hearing what you want to play and hearing the melodies and not thinking in um in uh not thinking in patterns and not thinking in formulas um the the best kind of music is created um out of song you know out of voice um so i just made it you know try to turn that into a practical practice and and i started practicing singing scales in my head okay so like the same way i really encourage my students to sing everything we practice uh whether it's rhythm whether it's we're practicing rhythm or whether we're practicing uh, sight reading or if we practice uh intonation especially intonation then i really encourage my uh, my students to to try and sing whatever they're practicing on and i do that myself as well um but yeah the next level is is not to just sing it but to actually try to recreate that sound in your head so it's easier if you if you take a sound that it's very familiar to you like your voice for example so see if you can do that um i'm gonna sing a note ba okay we don't know what note that is but see if you're able to imagine that note in your in your head not sing it don't try to produce it don't try to you know to whisper that note just try to imagine yourself singing that note and trying and really waiting for the point where you feel like you have the pitch okay there's a point that you if if you're able if if you um um if you have the skills to do that now then um you'll see that there's a point where you start imagining something vague but there's a point where you actually feel like you're hitting that pitch you're recreating the exact same pitch in your head and it's really hard to maintain it okay it's really hard to focus for a long time to to keep that pitch ringing in your head but try to try to do that and and try to see if there's even one second where you're able to lock on to that pitch and hear it inside your head so here's the note Ba okay were you able able to do that who 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 felt like uh he succeeded. He was able to get that one note. Ba you can imagine your voice singing it inside your head. You can imagine um, a violin playing that note, a piano, whatever feels, feels uh, natural and, and familiar to you. Okay, great. Awesome. So the next stage would would be to, to try and actually... Um, okay, let's see if you can do that. So I'm going to sing a note and then I want you to try it and imagine. Awesome. Try to imagine a note a whole step above that in your head. Okay, so I will sing the note, then you can try and recreate the note in your head again, and then try to find, like go up a whole step in, in, in your inner ear. Ba
So, so how, how did it go uh, now with singing a whole step above? It's a little harder, right? Because now you don't really have a reference anymore of, of the note that I sing for you. I wish it wouldn't take so long for the comments to to arrive. Like the delay is very big. Yes, you'll notice you'll notice a, a lot of uh your your uh a lot of inclinations as you Okay. That, that's fine. Whatever, whatever note. I thought I thought you guys are trying to uh, start it from the note that I gave you there. Ba, I think that was it. Ba, um, I see. Well, anyway, um, try you know try to mess around with that, and um, and try to sing scales. You know something. Something um, uh, really cool that you can do is try and, and uh, sing scales. Well, first you need to practice just singing scales in your head with that inner ear. And then you can kind of try and test yourself to see how well you're doing. So let me give you an example of how you can uh, use uh, the Tanpura, which is um, an Indian um, uh, uh, bass string instrument that gives us kind of a drone. Uh, you can use any type of drone, but take take this drone and then um, test to see how well you're keeping the scale in your head um, through that drone. Let me show you. So here's a drone in um, C sharp. So what I would do, I would decide on a scale or mode that I'm practicing. So let's say um, um, let's say Lydian for the sake of the Indian music. Uh, I'll take a Lydian C sharp. So first I will just try and and sing in my head the mode okay and now I will try to do this I will count the, the notes that I'm going through with my fingers, but I'm gonna I'm gonna like omit one note and then sing a note and then omit a note and then or like sing a note in my head and then singing out loud and then sing it in my head and then sing it out loud and let's see if it works. I'm not promising anything. So that's our tonic, right? Ba ba. Ba, 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 ba. I think I might miss missed it here around the fifth note going down. I usually get confused with counting backwards. But um but you get the point. This is a great way for you to kind of audit yourself a little bit if you're really able to to follow the the notes. 
let's try with a uh, different skill. Let's try minor. Uh, or like Dorian. Dorian mode. First I'm going over the scale. Excuse me, I need to play the second one. So I don't know who who of you may able to uh, was able to to uh, follow me and figure out whether I was uh, right or wrong. I think I actually I got it right uh, perfectly now with the Dorian. Before that with the Lydian, I'm pretty sure I had a mistake, like um, around the 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 fourth note going down or something like that. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really uh, crazy exercise, and that's just the beginning of uh, exploring that concept of the inner ear. This is how you kind of develop that, um, you sharpen your imagination, basically. That's what you do. And um, how I feel about that is that the stronger you're able to, or the louder you're able to train your inner, your inner voice to be, um, the better you're able to kind of hear it and focus on it as you're improvising. And, and playing and kind of hear the note that you're aiming to and that's a that's a great skill uh, for improvisers and it's a great skill um, hello everyone who joined in by the way we got a lot of people who joined in right at the end get out of class you're late um, good to see everyone um, so yeah the the this is just this is just the tool that later on we want to use um, for uh, for improvisation and uh, thank you I'm Tonali um, or in our cases being violinists it's not it's useful for us just you know not even if we're not improvising just playing because uh, as violinists or any bowed uh, instrument fretless bowed instrument we need to have such strong hearing of the note that we're the note that we're playing the note that we're about to play because uh, this what kind of leads our fingers and this what may this what determines whether our int intonation is going to be right or not and um you know that if you you need to do like a big leap in an octave for example on the violin you need to jump to higher register or something you know that if you don't hear the note that you're aiming to, you're not gonna get it. Because we can't, we can't know on a fretless instrument, like, what note is over here? Who knows? No one knows. We can just know by the, by the feeling that we teach our, the, the muscle memory that we teach our hand and fingers, and by hearing the note that we're aiming to. Uh, that's eventually the last, uh, the last, um, the last skill or tool that really determines if we play the note right is the sharp is how sharp are our ears if we're able to pre-hear the note that we're aiming to so i believe that strengthening that inner ears uh hearing and visualization helps you in in uh 
in that process of hearing the note that you're aiming to. Um, so I'll just show you very quickly. Thank you for the hearts. <laughs> um, let me show you real quickly what I like to do with that. Um, be even before I get to it, playing over a standard or, you know, standard or, or just my tune or any, any, any tune that I improvise over, um, um, even before that, we just want to start and mess around and play against this uh, inner inner ear that we have. So we want to try and um, if it, either um, even sing out loud. That's also very useful to kind of sing a phrase and then try to play it with your instrument, um, react to it with your instrument. Um, nice, Aaron. I, I actually learned some Indian music, but not um, Indian violin, unfortunately. I learned some uh, Carnatic music on sitar and tabla when, uh, like, a few years back. Um, that's how I got acquainted with the, with Tanpura uh, and Indian music as well. Um, so yeah, so I would put on uh, the Tanpura again. C sharp. This way we also get to practice the intonation. And first I would just try and sing a uh, single line and then try to recreate it with the instrument. Try to sing uh, longer lines, more complex lines, and, and then try to see if you're able to sing a, a line in your head and then repeat it. So, um, yeah, it's, it's way harder to, to, um, to try and sing the, the lines in your head and then repeat them. But you see that as you practice, start, you know, start off by just practicing very simple, uh, simple patterns for your inner ears. Just try to, you know, play a note on a keyboard and then see if you can recreate the pitch in your mind uh, or on your instrument, whatever instrument that is. Then try to play maybe two notes and see if you're able to recreate them in your mind. And then, and then try to create the sequence yourself. So you give yourself a beginning note and then tell yourself, all right, I'm going to sing in my head a major scale over it um, or, or modes. Or, you know, and start practicing different, uh, different scales, different modes in your inner ear. And... Um, well, first, it will give you a really good uh, check on whether you're actually hearing and understanding a scale 
Um, Because if you don't really hear the sound of the scale, then you will not be able to recreate it in your mind. You're going to have to practice, practice, play it more, sing it back more, and slowly try to recreate the sound of it in your head. And um, uh, the better you know and familiar with the sound of the scale, the easier it will be for you to visualize the, visualize the pitches in your head. So start with simple exercises of just, of just trying to sing scales, arpeggios, anything you practice on your violin, any simple, you know, simple uh, musical exercise you do, see if you can recreate the sound in your head. Um, uh, all right. Yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's also a slow process. Um, it's not something you can just run, you know, run over and do it. It's like, it's similar to the previous exercise, you know, the motion exercises I give you. These are like, these are heavy, this is heavy material. This is not something that you can just, you know, do on the way it's, I mean, although these are also kind of exercises that I would use uh, in practice, you know, in uh, when I take the subway somewhere or just trying, you know, to make the best out of some dead time, I would try to practice singing scales in my head. But um, but it, it these are things that take a lot of focus and very slow, uh, uh, slow um, uh, performance of, of these exercises. So do not take them lightly. Um, mm, so yeah, as I said, start off with the simple scale singing, uh, just very simple musical uh, uh, musical sequences, try to sing them in your head. And then the next stage, you can actually try and improvise some stuff and then, or create a short melody in your head and then see if you're able to find that melody in your instrument and really be true to yourself and really be conscious of whether you're actually sing, uh, playing exactly what you sang in your head and also whether there weren't any missing notes that you thought that you actually imagined the pitch of them, but you actually didn't. That's that's like delicate, you know, delicate kind of attention that you'll develop as you work on these exercises more. You'll see that sometimes, you know, you think that you're able to sing a scale, but then if you're if you're doing it slowly again, or if you're doing it going downward, suddenly you feel that there's one note that you're not actually able to recreate the sound in your head or you're singing a short melody in your head and then you're playing it back on the violin and you notice that there's one note that you're actually not sure what you sang there. So you really have to take it slowly and, and, and be very responsible for making sure that you're really able to recreate and visualize the pitch before you're trying to play it on your instrument. Um, Uh, so, Shuvan, you uh, you practice the the singing, the inner ear singing exercise. That's cool. I I um, yeah, I haven't met a lot of people that that uh, do that, but um, I did hear some people talk about inner ear, the importance of developing inner ears, especially in the aspect of uh, improvisation. So, uh, so yeah, you know, uh, we, you can take it to, you know, very deep levels. Uh, I just kind of practice scales, modes over it. Um, sometimes trying to sing back melodies, but uh, yeah, I haven't practiced it much in the past year or two, but I should get back to it. It's really um, a great practice, I think. Nice. All right. Good. Good to know that I'm not the the crazy, the only crazy person here <laughs> that does uh, insane and um, and unexplain unexplainable exercises. Um. All right. Cool, guys. So, uh, really appreciate you tuning in and sticking around. 
Nice. Like an old, is it, was it a, a violin teacher or an improvisation teacher? Um, so, and thank you for asking questions and I hope um, I gave you enough uh, stuff to work on and that would, it would, you would actually see progress uh, from that. Um, soon uh, there will be released uh, the videos from the video session uh, which I told some of you about uh, a, a video session I did with a new band for like this uh, music production which is kind of Israeli version of Tiny Desk um, thank you Tanya and thank you Shuvan definitely not not talking too much thank you for for sharing and thank you for asking questions uh that really makes the live stream experience much more fun you know to me where i don't feel like i'm speaking to myself uh thank you maya thank you for tuning in every time um um so yeah so that video session with a new band very interesting music influenced by uh, the Seben and Congolese rumba music that I showed you earlier, it will release will be released soon. Uh, but even before that, I'm releasing this Wednesday the video of uh, the tune Pnima, uh, which I released as a single about two weeks ago, or a week, two weeks ago. Um, so yeah, if you want to get a chance to listen to it again and also watch me play it and watch the incredible band members. Um, play it, then I'm releasing uh, the full video to YouTube uh, this Wednesday, um, 1 p.m. New York time, 7 p.m. Central Europe time. Uh, so check that out. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know, probably I'll, you know, I'll probably post about it on the day of the release and we'll also send an email about that uh, for whoever of you that is on my uh, mailing list. Um, and that's it. I hope to see you guys next uh, next Saturday. And uh, of course, if, if there are things that you'd like me to go over to cover next session, you can just send me uh, a message beforehand. Um, that would help me, you know, prepare something. If there's, uh, if there's something that you know, that maybe I can prepare in advance, it might be more thorough. Um, so you're very welcome. If there are any subjects that you're interested in regarding violin or improvisation, uh, just send me a message if you're tuning in. Um, thank you, Aaron. And thank you for sending me that music. Really cool. Uh, and yes, go practice. Every day, every hour. Don't eat, don't sleep. That's what my Russian teachers taught me. Um, uh yeah so thank you guys enjoy your weekend or your week um and i'll see you next saturday next shabbat bye bye